books. What is it that they share that collectively make them fit the common noun book? That's what I'm going to discuss. This book, Austerlitz by W.G. Sebold, has pictures in it. Pictures that are tied into the narrative. But as you go through, you think, wait a minute, this narrative is full of fictional characters, people that never existed. How can there be photos of them? And then you do a bit of uh, reading around and research and you find out that uh, Sabled collected these uh, sort of random photos from things like charity shops and flea markets and brilliantly has us all fooled that they are genuinely germane to the novel. This is another book full of pictures. In fact, it has more pictures than text. And these pictures make up the story because they're presented as an auction catalogue. The auction being items from a uh, married relationship that are being sold off as they get a divorce. And there is a little bit of text des describing the items as you would in an auction catalogue, like sort of date and state of wear and things like that. And it's fiendishly brilliant in that uh, you learn about this married couple, both as a couple and as individuals, through their items. But most books don't have pictures. This book, House of Leeds by Mark Danielewski, is visual as well, but it doesn't have pictures so much as a visual text. It is the bare raw material of books, which is words, which are situated on the page in such a way to make this an architectural novel in, in, in sort of visual terms because one of its themes is moving through a house that is constantly changing its dimensions. So that seems fitting that it has sort of an architectural uh, text. This book, 73 Days by Georges Perec, purportedly is unfinished because unfortunately the author lost his battle uh, with cancer before he finished it. Except, I believe that actually, no, it's written deliberately to suggest it's unfinished, but the author had finished the project. And he did this as a way of sort of flipping the bird to the Grim Reaper in saying, ha ha, I managed to get there first. I finished this book before you could take me. Whereas this book, Franz Kafka's America, is genuinely unfinished because Kafka was a neurotic perfectionist who would never let go of his, all three of his novels were unfinished because he'd never let go of them uh, to be published and put to public scrutiny. This book, uh, Space Invaders by Nona Fernandez is written in Spanish, which none of these other ones are, um, which means it has the intercession of a translator. Um, now, the translator shares some features of the author in that the translator has to make word choices throughout every single sentence, but doesn't have the original sort of plot and story and shape of the narrative and all those sorts of things. So it's, um, you know, it is a different function from the author. This book has the unique facet of being created in this very room in which I'm shooting this video, because this is my book, Three Dreams, not Three Dreams of the Gear G, that's the previous book, um, The Death of the Author in Triplicate. No other book can say that. Now, this book is William Master's Lonesome Wife by William H. Gass. Um, it has a woman's name in the title. It has the body of a female on the front. And uh, when you start reading it, it's certainly a seductive female voice, but it's not a female human voice. It is the voice of the book. The book's voice is in the guise of a female human. Uh, it's ventriloquizing a female human, but it is the book which is speaking. It is the book that is trying to seduce its reader to penetrate further inside its text. So none of these books really um, share their content, you know, what they're doing, they're all doing it in different ways. So that is not the collectivity of what makes them books. So which brings us back to the physical nature, the material nature of a book, book as artifact, in that you can say that, uh, again, you know, they're all different shapes and sizes, all different colours and designs on the cover. I mean, just take these sort of, these books, completely different 
dimensions, and yet they're all books. So I think what we can say is that books are printed pages uh, which are bound together between covers. So that is the materiality of books, and all books share that to some extent, until, until of course you consider e-books, where you have exactly the same book as that in a, in a digital form, and it has no printed pages, uh, it has digital pages, and it has no covers except a thumbnail. The other um, facet of what they all share is their function, and that is uh, they are meant to be read, uh, that therefore they work through language, um, that uh, they are read for either entertainment and or instruction. Um, but that's about it, really. Um, it's not, in that sense, it's not a very useful noun, because there are other versions of books, you know, you have manuals, you have log books, you have art books, which are only pictures, uh, you have notebooks, etc 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 and for the purposes of this discussion I'm just going to stick to the novel form uh, of book which I suppose is a sub subcategory of book uh, a very big one um, but still uh, that's what what I'm going to use to stand for the rest of this this discussion about books so there are a few things beyond the sort of artifact of a book and the fact that it operates through language uh, and that is a form of entertainment and um, the, a book is just a form of media in the same way as a TV show or a film or a, um, a digital downloaded song, you know, whatever. These are all different forms of media. Um, broadcasting um, uh, material, data, whatever, uh, to, to its audience. Um, but a few other shared features. Uh, you could say that they all spring from the imagination of human beings, although even that is coming increasingly under challenge with AI. Um, although I suppose, again, you could say that AI was created and programmed by uh, human consciousness. So it's sort of a one remove, still human, um, uh, sort of by proxy, really. Um, so they are spring from a human imagination. And uh, they have the same operating system, uh, all books, and that is the operation of language. And um, you would also say that, in general, they are um, monolithic uh, blocks of print. Uh, um, with numbered pages, usually, the, the numbers guiding you chronologically. You know, if you put down a book and come back to read it later, as long as you've remembered the page number, you could pick up where you've left off, so you're not sort of uh, messing up the chronology of the book. I say that, but this book, uh, Numbers, uh, the Book of Numbers by Joshua Cohen, has a very strange numbering system. I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this, because they're quite small. But near the beginning, we've got uh, pages 1.68 and 1.69. You think, OK, well, it's a bit a bit random but it's legitimate um, but then we sort of move on to uh, further into the book and here we've got 0 0.200 and 0 0.201 what's that all about how are we supposed to crack that chronological code and then towards the end of the book we go back to the numerical system of 1.512 and 1.513 and although I enjoyed this book, I can't say I ever cracked its numerical code of page numbering. Uh, another thing we could say about the novel is that generally it's um, stories and narratives with characters and events and thoughts. Um, that, that they all share that, except um, Scarlett Thomas's uh, Our Tragic Universe. Uh, is willfully anti-narrative. It refuses to offer a narrative and in doing so it explores our reliance on narrative. It looks at non-Western uh, forms of storytelling which have an entirely different uh, narrative style uh, from ours. Um, so that is willfully non-narrative. And David Markson's book, This Is Not A Novel, starts on page one Thank goodness this does have page numbers. It's not actually page one, it's page 13, but you, you take my point. 
a novel, um, writer is pretty much tempted to quit writing. Writer is weary unto death of making up stories. A novel with no intimation of story whatsoever, writer would like to contrive, and with no characters, none. And uh, this book, unusually uh, for a novel, um, uses factoids, quotes from real life historical people, and it is through the artful organisation of these that in fact it does become page turning and it does, in between the cracks you get a very faint sense of the character of the writer who's writing this book, who's putting this book together. But it's distinctly non-narrative because it's groupings of unrelated, seemingly unrelated facts from different historical time periods, from people in different professions, uh, and yet it is the artful grouping that does give them coherency. A collectivity, which is after all what we're trying to <laughs> fathom in the nature of books. So there you have all these wonderful books. I will say that I chose these uh, as they are some, but not all of my favourites. But I also chose them because I wanted to illustrate the diversity of the physical form of the book. That that's, you know that we are limited in the features we could derive uh, in order to classify them under the noun book. Now, language is obviously the key aspect of, of books. And I just wanted to talk about, you know, how language is the operating system of books. So um, we have things in the world. They are given names and those names when they are uttered not in the presence of the thing or the object, i.e. it's not before our very eyes or we're not holding it, uh, conjure up an image of what those things are. So, for example, if an author writes, a cat walked across her path, straight away the reader knows what, what the author means by a cat. And if the author hasn't um, embellished that, that sort of cat as it was white, it was... Um, you know, very furry, or it was scrawny, or it had half an ear torn off from a previous fight, or it was mangy, with clumps of fur missing. You know, if, it has, if the author hasn't provided any of that information, the chances are that when the reader reads a cat walked across the, part, the woman's path, uh, the, 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 the reader will fill in some of the details through their own knowledge and experience and understanding of the image of cat. So, for example, they might have cats in their family and they might, you know, therefore laser in on it's a tortoiseshell cat or a ginger tom or um, a Siamese cat. Um, or if, uh, if the person has allergy, is allergic to cat fur, they might sort of, as they read that line, they might uh, subconsciously uh, rub their nose to signal their relationship with cat fur. Or even they might have a shudder because they're cat phobic, as my wife is. So there is this sort of understanding, almost a telepathy, of the unit of the word bearing an image that the reader grasps hold of, because the act of reading is what Marianne Wolfe calls that miracle of communication between an author who is absent and the reader who is present. Um, so take another, another word, say mountain, if the author says, in the distance there were mountains. Again, the reader knows what a mountain is. They, they have an image of a mountain, but you know, we don't have mountains as pets. We're not, we don't have them in our daily life unless we live in a mountainous region, or we have traveled on a holiday to mountains, or we are a mountaineer. But basically most of us, myself included, don't have um, a sort of segmented, differentiated version of mountains as we might for cats. Uh, I myself couldn't tell you the difference other than where they are geographically located between Kilimanjaro, K2 and Everest, um, which may make me mountaineerist, um, that they all look the same to me. Um, apologies if, if people find that offensive. Uh, but again, it has an image that, that conjures up something in, in the reader, and that's how books can operate. That from the imagination of the author, it engages... Uh, the imagination of the reader because they have a shared language and shared set of image um, connections. Uh, of course, the reader will often go their own way with it. As I say, you know, if the, if the author hasn't put in any detail about the nature of the cat that crossed the, part, the woman's path, 
the reader might supply it from their own imagination. OK, so I just want you to bear in mind that that's the operating system of language, because now I want to talk about the phenomenolo... I always get this word wrong. The phenomenological uh, question which put very simply is that there are two views on what we call reality that have come down to us through you know, philosophy and religion, theolo theology, uh, and even science, and to some extent language itself. Those two views are the materialist view and the idealist view. Now the materialist view is very simple, that there are all these things, all these objects in the world, we can look outside our window, see a street lamp, see the sun. We know that the Earth is the third planet uh, orbiting that sun. Um, that these are hard and fast and undeniable uh, material objects that have existence. Uh, it gets slightly complicated when you have things that are more abstract, such as the notion of justice. Um, and we have to enshrine that justice in a code of laws which are set down. Um, although in Britain it's set down uh, as precedent, it's not like the Bill of Rights and the Constitution that you have in America, it's far more woolly over here in the UK. So that's the materialist view, that, that there are all these you know, hard and fast objects that you can touch, smell, see, if you kick it, something solid like a stone, you're going to feel pain because it has a solid solidity to it. The other side is idealism, that yes, there may well be all these material things around us, but they would have no meaningful existence without humans bringing them meaning. And we humans bring them meaning by naming them, by grouping them together, by classifying them, like with cats. Uh, you know, not all cats have uh, tails, but they all have whiskers. Um, all those, but all these different books that I held up before, they all have different shapes, sizes, colours, they all have completely different content, yet we call them all books. So, so the, the, the naming of things means that they spring, that meaning springs from human consciousness. So, for example, if mankind was wiped out by, let's say, a disease overnight, a mountain would still exist. It would still be, you know, propping its peak through the clouds. But there'll be no one there to observe it, to witness it, to name it as a mountain, and to affirm its continued existence. The mountain itself has no consciousness, it's, consciousness, it's inanimate. And though there may be species of animal life that live on that mountain, they don't have language, they don't bother naming things. Their only concern is finding food and avoiding being eaten. So they don't perceive that they live on a mountain, they just have instinctive reactions to the local environment where they find themselves up on that mountain. So these two concepts are sort of always in you know, battle with each other. Um, and, that, and from that, um, literature can spring because apart from the material artifact of the book, the content of the book is entirely exists within the realm of idealism. From the author's mind, you know, the author only has words, that's all the author has on their palette, and conjures up through these words the images in the, author, in the mind of the reader. So again, there's that sort of mind meld, but they have no material substantive existence outside of reading the book and the reader retaining memory of what they have read. So the authors inevitably are in the idealist camp. Now, authors do not deal in anything material other than, as I say, their finished product. They deal only with words. And words can describe reality, they can uh, classify and conjure up images, but they are not in and of themselves reality. They are a code, a cipher, a nomenclature to do the reality, uh, but they in themselves, words have no material existence, you speak and the words, you know, disappear into the air. And by way of finishing this video, I'd just like to talk about my book, um, Death of the Author in Triplicate, because I, this book is devoted uh, to offering my contribution to this sort of eternal debate between materialism and idealism. So part one sees uh, a, uh, a senior investigating officer, or what the Americans would call a lead detective, 
uh, walking up to a new freshly minted murder scene and he is charged with overseeing the investigation to bring about justice and as I've already mentioned justice is an abstract concept. Justice doesn't exist. Justice doesn't exist in the animal kingdom for example. It only is brought into existence through codified laws as to what's legal and illegal and a deterrent system based on that to try and stop people from infracting the law. And when people do infract the law, then the so-called weight of justice is brought down on them. And police have a very important part in that because they help produce the case against the accused, mainly through uh, physical evidence which is increasingly more significant than any other type of evidence because of things like DNA, forensic science, um, phone tower um, blips. So you have a very material base of evidence in order to meet the codified laws in order to deliver justice. And what do we mean by delivering justice? Well, it seems to me it means two things. One is it takes a criminal off the street to stop them reoffending. If they're behind bars, they can't, in theory, um, continue committing the crime for which they've been sent away for. And to bring some sort of justice to the victim or the uh, family of the victim, if the victim is dead, in the sense that they have seen who was responsible for uh, the death of their, their relative and can at least console and comfort themselves that that person is being punished for it by being denied their liberty. Now, there are all sorts of arguments as to whether that's a genuine uh, sense of justice, because obviously the, the murdered person can never be brought back, which would really be the ultimate justice. I'm not going to get into that here and now. It's covered in the book to some extent. So this detective is charged with gathering material evidence in order to bring um, the perpetrator to book. And when he gets to the crime scene, he sees this sort of gro you know, perhaps the most material object in the human panoply, which is a dead body, because it reminds us all that we are all finite beings um, and that ultimately we are just this mass of matter and sinew and bone and all this sort of stuff. We just have to have a consciousness which can make sense to some extent of our life as we're leading it. So all crimes have a sort of gross materiality at the heart of them, whether it's murder or theft or, or whatever it is. Unfortunately for him, uh, this murder has been staged uh, within a completely symbolic setting. That is a suburban back garden with a shed full of soil, a jacuzzi full of water, an airy greenhouse, and a burn pit which is roofed, which is full of cinders. And he discovers that buried within each of these substances, although not buried in uh, air in the greenhouse, but openly visible, are ancient statues of gods relevant to the element in which they find themselves. So gods of thunder and storms and wind are in the greenhouse, gods of rivers and oceans are in the jacuzzi, uh, gods of fire are obviously in the fire pit, and gods of fertility and earth and the underworld are in the potting shed. So again, this sort of gross materiality of these elements of water, of soil, of air, which may be not gross, but is still a material substance uh, made up of oxygen, nitrogen, um, gases like neon and krypton and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, and yet they are given symbolic value, idealism value, non-material by being associated with ancient divinities who we no longer believe in, the vast majority of them, and what they stand for, what these four elements stand for. There used to be a theory of knowledge that this is, these are the four essential elements of matter from which reality is constructed from. Science has somewhat disproved that, um, but still it is a idea of trying to explain materiality back in the ancient world. Unfortunately for the policeman, that story or that part of the story ends very abruptly and we move into part two. And part two sees uh, an argument between an author's widow and the author's um, literary agent. And in some ways, a literary agent is the other spouse of an author. 
Uh, and they are arguing over who has the rights to an uncompleted manuscript. And that uncompleted manuscript is part one of the book. Now, an uncompleted manuscript uh, is pure idealism because it's not been finished and it's not been brought into the material world. It's not been turned into a book, although both the author and the widow want to turn it into a book. Just they have different opinions on to the best way of doing that. So they are arguing that each knows the deceased writer better than the other. Uh, and that deceased writer is, no longer exists. He no longer has materiality. So they are appealing to ideas of this writer, memories of this writer, attributes claimed for this writer. And they're really arguing over sort of position of his soul. And of course, the soul has over sort of you know, the course of history been claimed by both the materialists and the um, idealists. Um, you know, as, as residing firmly in their world, I think most people would probably say it has no existence at all other than in language, uh, that there is no such thing as the soul. But anyway, that's a, <laughs> that's a completely different debate. So that's part two of the book. Part three of the book sees a writer. And don't forget, we have put writers in the camp of idealism because they deal in ideas and words from their imagination, not in material objects. You know, a writer, unless they're doing sort of uh, personalised copies, isn't responsible for the production of this physical artefact, only the content within. And the writer has written parts one and two of this book that you've just read, and he's tidying away his desk in his study at home, in which he has been producing this book. Uh, but it's worth noting that there are material uh, elements to producing uh, even the pure idealism of a book. You know, he works on a computer, or it could be a typewriter, it could be paper and pen. Um, he has notes up on the wall. Uh, he has a computer printer to print out pages so that he can edit with pencils and highlighter pens and red ink pens, all this sort of thing. Uh, there are cigarettes, uh, packets, and soda cans in the bin that fuel him while he's on his writing stints. Uh, there's even a groove worn into the carpet where he slid uh, in his wheeled chair from the desk to the wall where the notes are to consult them because he doesn't want to break the momentum. He doesn't want to get out of the groove of writing. So he slides over there as quickly as possible and in doing so has worn a groove in the carpet. So there is a material element to the nature of writing. You know, the, the humdrum, mundane nature of sitting down to write, which is contrasted with the high concept ideas of materialism versus idealism in part one, with justice, codified laws, material evidence, and, and all that sort of stuff, set in a, a staged crime scene of the symbolic and, again, the idealism, the idealistic realm. Um, here, the author purely exists in the idealistic world, but even within that, in a sort of yin-yang way, there's still a seed of the materials that he needs um, to to you know construct his book and we get a lot uh, about all the things that are on the journey between sending a completed manuscript to his editor and the production of the finished book and what that launches such as marketing interviews the reception from critics type you know how much of what's on the wall does he need to sort of put into a literary archive all of these sorts of things are, are broached. So it's not just a book, it isn't just the content, it's all this stuff around it, all these peripherals. And finally, we have the ultimate prime mover, which is the writer behind the writer. So the writer in this book has produced parts one and two, and the reader is reading in part three about how the writer goes about doing that. But there is a power behind the throne, which is me, the real life writer, and there is a sort of tension between how much of what is revealed here about the writer in part three matches my own uh, writing process. So, for example, I don't have um, things on the wall. I don't use a printer to edit. I do everything on, on the computer screen. Um, I don't, haven't worn a groove in the carpet. But the, equally, there are many things uh, that I do share with the writer. Uh, such as, you know, how critics, you know, respond and all, all that sort of thing. And it's a game, I guess, that I'm playing with the reader. 
I know the answers, or at least I believe I know the answers of how much I have in common and how much is completely made up with the writer in here. Um, so again, you have this sort of idealism of the author who has created parts one and two of the book, but also me as an author, the idealism of me creating part three of the book, which has knock-on implications for parts one and two. Um, so, uh, if that sounds like your thing, I shall leave a link in the notes um, where you can buy this. You can only buy it direct from the uh, publishers. You can't buy it from uh, Amazon because they are committed <laughs> not to work with Amazon. Um, and just to say, um, like all my videos, uh, this is unscripted, um, which is why there are so many ums and ahs in it. And that, uh, unfortunately, um, I... Although a lot of what I've been talking about is the, I suppose, the process of many years of thinking about the craft of writing and the, I suppose, the philosophy of writing, how lang, you know, think about language, how language works. Um, but it is sort of scripted uh, in that last night I went to bed at just after one o'clock a.m. as I normally do, and I couldn't get to sleep because everything that I've said to you was sort of forming and being composed in my mind. I actually wanted to go to sleep. I didn't go to bed to lie down with the intention of doing this. One of the things I did is I got up in the middle of the night and I selected these books because I'd even picked those books as I was composing this. Um, so I lay uh, awake all night till about sort of 5.30. I had the milkman, uh, sorry, not the milkman, I had the rubbish lorries arrive. Today is a rubbish collection in my area of London. Um, and I was just playing it over and over and over and over again, uh, slightly refining it, but basically uh, just wanting to remember it so that I could you know, say it you know, as a, all of a piece without stopping the camera, which is what I've done today. So uh, this cost me a night's sleep, um, which is not unusual. Um, often when I'm writing novels, it costs me a, a night's sleep because I think a lot of writers are writers 24-7, that they can never switch it off. As I say, even though I only wanted to go to sleep, that's all I craved. I, you know, the writing part of my brain wouldn't let me. Um, and <laughs> I compose this, etc. So... Um, I feel that that's another argument uh, for you to consider why you might uh, buy this book <laughs> is that um, I do put a lot of thought into the craft that, uh, of writing that uh, I pursue, um, that I've sacrificed many nights of sleep, although, you know, why should uh, you care about that? At the end of the day, I've put a book out and either it will appeal to you or, or not appeal to you. Um, but um, yeah. <laughs> I would find it most rewarding if you felt moved to uh, want to buy this book. So, uh, thank you, BookTube. Till next time.